And today I'm going to talk to you about our recent work on targeting the molecular chaperone HSP90 to cripple fungal pathogens. And I'm going to do some work to really set the stage for why the biology is really cool, why we think this is a really exciting target. And then I'm going to move into how we're thinking about uh, developing molecules that can selectively target HSP90 in fungal pathogens, since that will be the real challenge for moving forward. So to start, let me introduce you to HSP90. It is a molecular chaperone. It's conserved and essential in all eukaryotes in which it's been tested. So therein lies the therapeutic challenge that we're going to face as we move on later on. But what it does as a chaperone is it regulates the form and function of a very diverse but select set of client proteins, many of which are key regulators of cellular signaling. Now, HSP90 function is inherently modulated by conditions that affect protein folding, so like environmental stress. So for example, at elevated temperatures like those encountered with fever, you have increased protein misfolding and HSP90 function can actually be overwhelmed. So it gets titrated away from specific client proteins and has to go deal with general problems in protein folding. So as such, it's really an environmentally contingent hub of regulatory circuitry. And as I'll show you throughout this talk, it regulates the form and function of many of the different um, signaling regulators that you've heard about already in this meeting, such as calcineurin and others that you'll hear about later on, including RAS signaling. So work in Saccharomyces cerevisiae has established that HSP90 interacts with about 10% of the proteome, and our analysis in Candida albicans suggests that the number is very similar in the pathogen. So it's emerged as a very promising target for a number of different therapeutic areas. Most specifically, it's been most well developed for oncology applications. And it's also been recently found to have benefits in terms of neurodegenerative diseases. And the most recent uh, areas on the horizon are infectious diseases caused by protozoa and parasites, as well as fungal pathogens, which is uh, largely from our work and also from Bill Steinbach's work. So I'm going to just first show you some basic uh, validation that this is a cool target and why we're so excited by it. So firstly, inhibiting HSP90 uh, abrogates drug resistance in diverse fungal pathogens. So I'm just showing you a few examples here. On the top row here is Candida albicans. This is a clinical isolate that's quite resistant to azoles. So you can see here that uh, the isolate is growing right up to the test strip. And if we include an HSP90 inhibitor like galdenomycin, which is a natural product in the medium, you can see we've got a concentration that doesn't affect growth of the fungus on its own. You've got lots of growth away from the antifungal strip. But you can see this very potent <coughs> synergy where it makes the antifungal work very effectively. And it actually converts azoles from static to sidal agents. We also can exploit uh, structural analogs, which have been in clinical development for cancer. And we can show that they also very potently uh, enhance antifungal activity. So it works not only with azoles and with candida species, but also with the aspergillus species shown here. This is aspergillus fumigatus. And with the echinocandins is what you can see in this row. So here's a clinical isolate of aspergillus, and you can see it can grow right up to this test strip with the echinocandin. There is some inhibition of growth, but you can still see that there is significant growth up to the strip. If we include the HSP90 inhibitor galdenomycin, we get a very beautiful zone of clearing, and it takes higher concentrations of the analogs in clinical development um, but they do indeed have potent synergistic effects. And as I mentioned, Bill Steinbeck's lab has done beautiful work further exploring HSP90's role in drug resistance in aspergillus, so I'm not going to go further into that area. Uh, I'll focus first on, on candida albicans before moving into some very new stuff. So the synergy works not only in vitro, but it also works in vivo. And so what I'm showing you here is a rat central venous catheter model of biofilm infection, and this is in collaboration with David Andes. And so what we've done here is there's a, a rat catheter, and in this case, we've started with a genetic proof of principle. So this system will come up again later in the talk, so I'll just introduce it to you. It's a good way to study essential genes, for example, in our diploid pathogen. You can delete one allele and place the remaining allele under the control of a repressible promoter. In this case, it's a tetracycline repressible promoter. So we can dial down expression of our gene of interest with tetracycline or the analog doxycycline. So what you can see here, we've taken out the catheter and imaged it by scanning electron microscopy. You can see here in the absence of treatment, we get a very robust biofilm that forms. If we have doxycycline around, even with transcriptional repression of HSP90, we still have a robust biofilm. So there's sufficient levels of HSP90 for, for proliferation. You can see here with the azole, we still have a fairly robust biofilm because these biofilms are intrinsically quite resistant to azoles. But transcriptional repression of HSP90 transforms the azoles from not very effective to fairly efficacious. And from a more you know, therapeutically relevant point of view, we can actually take HSP90 inhibitors that have been in clinical development, and we can employ them after the biofilm has actually formed. 
And so that's what we've done here, and we're looking at colony forming burden in the catheter. And you can see we have a high fungal burden when we treat with just fluconazole or the HSP9 inhibitor alone, but the combination can completely sterilize the catheter. So we think this is pretty cool, and there's absolutely no toxicity in this context where we have both the drug delivery and the fungal infection co-localized. So we think that this is a really exciting area that we're exploring. Um, but for systemic applications, we think that we'll need a more selective agent. So we've done a lot of work to explore the circuitry through which HSP90 regulates drug resistance, and it does so through a number of regulators that you've heard about already today, for example, calcineurin, and also the terminal MAP kinase of the cell wall integrity pathway, it's MKC1 in C. albicans, or MPK1 in Cryptococcus neoformans. So HSP90 regulates not only drug resistance, but also many key virulence traits in fungal pathogens, and I'm gonna give you one example here with Candida albicans, and this is with morphogenesis. So for C. albicans, it can exist as a yeast form, and it can also transition into a filamentous form. And this capacity to transition is very important for virulence. So mutants that are locked in either the yeast form or the filamentous form tend to be highly attenuated in virulence. Now the transition is induced by exposure to host relevant cues such as serum or nutrient starvation. But one thing that had been observed for decades is that there was requirement for an increase in temperature of sort of host temperature, 37 degrees, for these cues to induce filamentation. So serum at 30 degrees, for example, would do absolutely nothing. And so the basis for why elevated temperature or host temperature were, was required had just been enigmatic for decades. So we thought that HSP90 might be sort of a key temperature sensor, given that its function is so tightly modulated by temperature increases that, that affect protein folding. And so we indeed found that if we simply compromise HSP90 function, we can induce robust transition to filamentous growth. And this work was done in collaboration with Joe Heitman. So if we inhibit HSP90 pharmacologically, we induce filamentation, and we can recapitulate these effects genetically. And so given that HSP90 is essential, and often that it regulates a key virulence trait, we examined what would happen in terms of depletion of HSP90 in the pathogen in a host's model of systemic infection. And this was done in collaboration with John Perfect. And so what you can see here is using our tetracycline repressible HSP90 strain in the presence of tetracycline in the drinking water for the mice, we can completely sterilize kidneys when we transcriptionally repress HSP90 in the pathogen. So this is sort of a genetic proof of principle that this would be a good target if we can selectively target this protein in uh, the pathogen. And so we've also done some work to figure out the biology of how HSP90 regulates morphogenesis, and it turns out it's very different than how it regulates drug resistance, so calcineurin is not a key player for this trait. So in fact, it works through a couple of different pathways. One of them you're gonna hear about later on from Andy Alspa, and this is the RAS signaling pathway. So we found that HSP90, together with a co-chaperone called SGT1, physically interacts with the adenyl cyclase CYR1, and if we deplete HSP90 or, C or uh, SGT1, we then activate signaling through this cascade. So then if we delete any positive regulators of this signaling cascade, we completely block filamentation in resp response to HSP90 inhibition or in response to many other cues. So HSP90 is sort of modulating activity of this very core morphogenetic signaling pathway. So we figured that since HSP90 is so pleiotropic, it probably has effects on many other pathways that are affecting filamentation. And so we screened sort of a, a set of mutants that we happened to have on hand, which was a very small set at this time. It was about 3% of the genome. And we found indeed that there were a number of other very key regulators of morphogenesis through which HSP90 was working. So this set over here that I'm highlighting are ones that are involved in cell cycle control. So we found that HSP90, together with another co-chaperone called CDC37, interacts with the cyclin-dependent kinase CDC28 and has a profound effect on morphogenesis. And then we found this other pathway which had never been characterized in C. albicans, and this was required for filamentation in response to HSP90 compromise. And this included another cyclin-dependent kinase, FO85, a cyclin PCL1, and a transcription factor HMS1. And so what we found was, well, the RAS pathway is important for morphogenesis in response to many different cues. This pathway is much more specialized in response to HSP90 inhibition or elevated temperature, again, indicating this, this link between temperature and HSP90 function. So given that we found many different pathways that were important by just looking at a very small proportion of the genome, we wanted to take this to a larger scale and interrogate a mutant collection that we were fortunate 
to, to obtain from Terry Romer. So this was a collection that Terry and his team made in addition to the heterozygous collection that he talked about. This was a collection of strains where he placed uh, the only copy of a particular gene under the control of the tetracycline repressible promoter so that you can dial down the expression of the essential gene and monitor relevant phenotypes. So this work was spearheaded by an amazing postdoctoral fellow, Teresa O'Meara, who trained here with Andy Alspa at Duke, as well as a phenomenal graduate student, Amanda Berry. So they then screened the library of about 2,400 strains to look for those that were unable to filament in response to geldenomycin. And so what you can see here is just a few examples. You can see at 30 degrees, all the strains grow as yeast, as we expect. If we expose them to the HSP90 inhibitor galdenomycin, the wild type filaments perfectly and doxycycline has no effect, which is what we would expect. You can see there's a number of mutants when we transcriptionally repress the target gene, they're completely blocked in filamentation. So for example, ERG11, which is a gene in the ergosterol biosynthesis pathway targeted by the azoles, it's unable to filament in response to galdenomycin as is the SEC6 strain and the CDC50 strain. There are a few mutants that show phenotypes that are not DOCS dependent, so the majority of what we focus on are those that are specifically dependent on DOCS. So we can then look at how related the phenotypes are in terms of inhibition of HSP90 with galdenomycin and looking at elevated temperature, which you may recall I mentioned can overwhelm HSP90's functional capacity. So what you can see here is we see very concordant results. You can see that most of the mutants that are blocked in response to galdenomycin are also blocked in response to elevated temperature. Although there are a few cases where it's discordant. So you can see it's blocked in response to galdenomycin, but not elevated temperature. And we have some interesting ideas for those guys. But so if we do this on a genome-wide scale, we've now done this with multiple different inducing cues. And we can take a look at what circuitry is really core for enabling polarized growth which versus which circuitry is actually important for sensing and responding to different <coughs> inducing cues. And so this is just an example of comparing those genes that are important for filamentation in response to galdenomycin or HSP9 inhibition with those that are important for filamentation in response to serum. And I don't expect you to get anything about you know, the gene names that are written up there, but just the overall trend that I'm going to walk you through. So the way the data is organized is the boxes here are the screening conditions. So this is serum with doxycycline or galdenomycin with doxycycline or the same cues without doxycycline. So remembering that doxycycline is there to depress transcription of the relevant target gene. The smaller colored boxes are all the genes. So these are the relevant strains that were blocked in filamentation in response to the cue that they're connected to. So for example, these guys in dark blue were only blocked in filamentation in response to serum with doxycycline, and these guys were only blocked in filamentation in response to galdenomycin with doxycycline. <coughs> Those that are in the lighter blue color are blocked in response to two conditions. So these guys are blocked in response to both serum and galdenomycin. So these guys could be more core for polarized growth, whereas these sets over here could be more specific in terms of sensing and responding to the giving cue. So one thing that was quite striking, we found 161 mutants that were blocked in filamentation in response to HSP90. So again, this is very pleiotropic. We've got a lot of pathways involved. But 43 of these have mitochondrial functions. So that's pretty interesting and suggests there might be some important functional connections between HSP90 and mitochondria, which is something we're actively exploring. So another group that was pretty cool are the ergosterol biosynthesis genes. And we found that these were very crucial for filamentation in response to diverse cues, both including serum and HSP90 compromise and elevated temperature. So what I've shown you thus far is that HSP90 is, uh, you know, regulates drug resistance of diverse fungi, and it regulates virulence traits in many fungal species as well. So we think that it's a very promising, you know, target for antifungal drug development. And we think about this in a couple of different ways. So one point is because of the expected impact on virulence, we think that good antifungal efficacy in a host context will not require complete inhibition of the target protein. So if we just simply reduce HSP90 function in the pathogen, we can attenuate virulence and we can then enhance sort of therapeutic efficacy and minimize sort of the potential for escape and resistance. Targeting HSP90 also provides an opportunity for combination therapy, which we heard a lot about from Jerry Wright's talk with current antifungals to enhance and restore efficacy against resistant pathogens. And this is something that's commonly done with antibacterials, but is very sorely needed for antifungals. So these are sort of why we're attracted to HSP90, but there's of course the major challenge, which is the fact that HSP90 is also very important in the host. So I told you it regulates calcineurin amongst many other proteins, 
And as we all know, calcineurin is very important for immune responses. So HSP90 is going to be very important for surviving stresses associated with fever during infection um, and mounting immune responses, among other things. So we really would need to be able to develop fungal selective agents in order to exploit this therapeutically. So is that feasible? That's the next frontier. So in terms of drug ability, it's, you know, it's a great target. There are tons of molecules out there. The first HSP9 inhibitors came on the scene about 20 years ago, and they were natural products. So galdanomycin and radicicol, which are shown over here, they're totally structurally unrelated. Uh, galdanomycin is an antimycin uh, benzoquinone, and the radicicol is a macrolide. And since that time, there have been dozens of structurally unrelated chemotypes that have now advanced into clinical trials. So this is a very big area um, for, for clinical development at this point. Now, in terms of achieving selectivity, we think that this is definitely a feasible possibility in that there's precedent. So in terms of structure-guided design, this has enabled the development of isoform selective HSP90 inhibitors. So these inhibitors were developed by Vertex, and they can actually distinguish human cytosolic HSP90 alpha and beta from the ER and mitochondrial isoforms. And I'll emphasize that these human isoforms are much more similar to each other than the fungal isoforms are to the human isoforms. So we've got much bigger differences in terms of sequence and structure than we do amongst these fungal isoforms, and they could achieve over a thousand-fold selectivity against these different targets. Further, the development of compounds that selectively target HSP90 has been achieved, again, using a structure-based approach for the protozoan parasite, Treponosoma brucei. So we think that there's real potential here for moving forward, and this motivated us to start by solving some crystal structures. And we started with Candida albicans since we had the most sort of data establishing this as a great target in that system. And we started with the N-terminal domain of HSP90, since that's the domain that's targeted by all HSP90 inhibitors that have been in clinical development to date. So again, we solved the crystal structure of the N-terminal domain. This was done with Ray Hoy and Juan Pizarro, and found that overall it's quite conserved with the human isoforms, which is what we would expect. It's a highly conserved protein. But we were delighted to find a larger and more accessible pocket right near the ATP binding pocket in the fungal protein. So over here is the C. albicans protein, and I've boxed this uh, larger and more accessible pocket. It also differs in charge. It's much more negatively charged in the fungal protein than in the human isoform over here. And so we basically reasoned that if we could add sort of bulkier moieties to existing HSP90 inhibitor scaffolds, we could develop molecules that could only dock in the larger fungal protein. So that was what we decided to try. And we, of course, needed a chemist because we don't do any chemistry in my lab. And so we collaborated with Lauren Brown, who is an outstanding chemist with John Porco's group at Boston University. And we decided to focus on radicicol as our lead scaffold for moving forward for a couple of reasons. So one, out of the existing scaffolds, it has the most potent antifungal activity, so it's a reasonable starting place. But more importantly, based on our structural insights, we had the greatest potential for fungal selectivity. So we figured that was a good starting place. And we can also leverage extensive exploration of these inhibitors that have emerged uh, for targeting human HSP90 in ongoing clinical trials. So there's a great deal of chemistry expertise that we can leverage in moving forward. So Lauren's approach has been to basically generate an initial set of oxime analogs of radicicol by reacting rea uh, radicicol with alkoxia amines. And so what we did was she generated seven. So this is a you know extraordinarily small set, especially for those people in, in industry in the room. But this is where we're starting to generate our preliminary data to get funding for the program. So out of our seven molecules, we could then look at selectivity for the fungal isoform over the human isoform. And so what we've done first is use a biochemical assay. So we're using a fluorescence polarization assay. And this allows us to monitor a real-time assessment of ligand binding in solution. So we can monitor how these inhibitors bind to human HSP90 compared to fungal HSP90 using lysates, which actually conserve all the co-chaperones and the other assemblies that can modulate um, selectivity. So what you're looking at over here is fold selectivity for the C. albicans protein over human protein, and this is looking at potency. So again, this is a very small set of compounds. We've got seven compounds, but we can already get some sort of nascent SAR or structure activity relationships from this compounds. So one point is that there's a very clear steric requirement for fungal selectivity. So these are the smallest oxines, and you can see that they're very potent, but you can see they're not very selective at all. So that's consistent with what our, our structure told us, right? We need a bigger molecule so that it's going to only dock in the fungal protein. So the small ones aren't so good. 
And we find that the actual oxime aryl ring substituent appears to alter uh, fungal selectivity to a great deal. So many of these molecules are sterically very similar, but we see a major difference in selectivity. And so 224 is our star. That's our lead molecule out of our grand set of seven. So that's, that's what we're moving forward with. And of course, biochemical assay is just the starting place. We have whole cell phenotypic assays on both the mammalian side and also on the fungal side. And so first I'll show you data uh, looking on the mammalian side. And so this work has been spearheaded by Luke Whitesell, who's at the Whitehead Institute, and who's been key in preclinical development of HSP9 inhibitors for cancer. So he's really guiding our pharmacology expertise here. And so we looked here simply at a simple assay for cytotoxicity with hep G2 liver cancer cell lines. And we focused on 224 since it's our sort of most fungal selective analog. And what you can see is 224 is about tenfold less toxic to human cells than the non-selective radicicle and geldenomycin, which is sort of consistent with our biochemical assay showing tenfold selectivity for the fungal protein. So we think that's cool. We've done lots now of whole cell assays with different fungi. And I'm going to focus on some of our very new work with Cryptococcus, which is a totally new foray um, in our lab and has been spearheaded by Teresa O'Meara. So here I'm showing you radicicol and 224, so that's our lead radicicol analog, and you're looking at uh, fungicidal activity of the compounds. So here's sort of a standard minimum inhibitory concentration assay where we have two-fold dilution series of the HSP90 inhibitors. As with Jerry's plots, green is growth and black is no growth. You can see here that geldenomycin is not very potent at all on its own. It has very little activity. But radicicol and 224 have pretty good activity, both against Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gadii. So the MICs are about 1.9 micromolar, and this is in rich medium. So we could probably get much lower MICs in a, in a more defined medium. So in terms of addressing cidality, what we can do is then spot cells that have been exposed to these drug combinations and just spot them onto rich medium without any drug to see if they can grow after they were exposed to the drug combinations. What you can see here is that the agents are pretty cidal. So this is, this is pretty good antifungal activity on its own, which, which, is, which is promising at this stage. So not only are they cidal, but they also enhance the activity of existing antifungal drugs. And it actually works with all of the classes we've looked at so far. I'm showing here azoles and echinocandins. So this is the similar sort of petri dish e-test format that I showed earlier. And you can see this is with Cryptococcus neoformans. Um, it, does, it is sensitive to fluconazole. The MIC is about 8 micrograms per mil on rich medium. If we include a non-inhibitory concentration of radicicol in the plate, you can see that we can increase the susceptibility about five-fold, so that's reasonable. This is now looking at it in a liquid context, an MIC plate setup, and you can see a low dose of radicicol can enhance fluconazole activity, and you can see we can also enhance the activity of caspofungin. And as you may recall from Jerry's work, there's not that many compounds that seem to reduce uh, caspofungin resistance of cryptococcus, so we think this is reasonably promising. Mm -hmm. So as with Cialbicans, it turns out that with Cryptococcus, if we inhibit HSP90, we affect not only drug resistance, but we also affect virulence traits. So the two that we've looked at in the limited time that we've had available thus far with these molecules are melanin production and capsule production. And so what you can see here is when we have melanin production, the colony turns brown. This is on Niger seed agar. If we inhibit HSP90 with radicicol or with 224, you can see we reduce melanin production. And this is in the absence of any inhibition of growth. So we're using sub-inhibitory concentrations. And you can also see down here the polysaccharide capsule in a strain that's untreated is greatly diminished when we inhibit HSP90 with either radicicol or with 224. So we think that this is really a, you know, a cool target and we think that we can leverage the structural differences to really generate fungal selective molecules. I'll emphasize 224 is our lead, but that's our lead out of you know, seven compounds. So we've got a pretty clear path forward to generate diversity synthesis libraries of these analogs and to optimize you know, potency and fungal selectivity and, and pharmacokinetic properties. Uh, we've just put in an NIH grant and hopefully we can gain some funding to support this program. But before I leave you, I want to just emphasize, you know, another important thing to think about when we're thinking about drug development is thinking about how resistance can emerge. And so as Jerry talked about, uh, combinations have a lot of advantages and they can minimize the emergence of resistance in a couple of different ways. So of course, you know, if you have multiple drugs, you can require multiple different mutations to confer resistance, so that's one benefit. And you can also minimize pathogen population size, right? So if you've got two drugs that more effectively kill, 
you can then have smaller population sizes, which minimizes the probability of getting resistant mutants. And so what we wanted to look at is really what are the fitness consequences of resistance to drug combinations, which has really never been explored. So to do so, we turned to a series of isolates of C. albicans, in this case, that had evolved resistance in a human host. So this is a series collected by Ted White and Spencer Redding, and they're organized so that these were recovered early during treatment from an HIV patient who was on fluconazole for about two years, and these guys here were recovered later during treatment. So if we inhibit HSP90 function with galdenomycin in this case, you can see that we reduce resistance of all the isolates, but you can kind of see that there's this interesting sort of step of increased resistance to the combination. Now I'll emphasize that this patient has never seen galdenomycin, so there's no selection here directly for resistance to the combination, but I will note that many patients that have candida infections undergo fever, and we know that fever compromises HSP90 function, so we think that that may have been the driving force that underlied selection for resistance to this combination. And notably, what we see is if we genetically reduce HSP90 in these strains, we completely recapitulate these effects. So these isolates have indeed evolved an azole-resistance phenotype that is partially independent of HSP90. So our real question was, what's the fitness consequence of this? Since ultimately, if resistance is going to you know, spread and persist in a pathogen population, this really depends on how fit the resistant pathogens are. So if it's very costly and these organisms have a major disadvantage in the absence of drug, right, if there's some kind of a trade-off, then they're unlikely to sort of be a major problem if you stop use of a drug for a period, right? They'll get outcompeted by their sensitive counterparts. So that's what we wanted to look at, and to do so, we focused on the initial starting strain, which, you know, we'll call the ancestor in this case for the series, and then the strains that were sort of flanking these major step increases in resistance. And we looked at fitness by pairwise competition assays, so we genetically marked the ancestor, showed that the marker had absolutely no effect on fitness, and then we could compete each of these isolates with the ancestor. And so we could do that in a myriad of different kind of environmental conditions. So first we, we did it in the same conditions I'm showing you here, so with galdenomycin and fluconazole. And as you'd expect, we see the same sort of stepwise increase in fitness. So the fitness is sort of tracking with the resistance phenotype as we would expect. But our real question was then trade-offs. So what do we see if we look in different kind of environmental conditions? So we assayed fitness in a bunch of different conditions that we thought might be relevant to the human host. And what you're seeing is the results plotted as a heat map. So in yellow are all those strains that had increased fitness under a given condition. So here are the strains here. So for example, with fluconazole and galdenomycin, which I already showed you, these guys all have increased fitness. You can also see they have increased fitness with fluconazole and a calcineurin inhibitor, FK506, which is exactly what we'd expect given the close relationship between HSP90 and calcineurin. And you can also see they have increased fitness at high temperature, which again is sort of consistent with fever potentially being a selective force that favors this process. But if you look over here, you can see there's a lot of blue, and the blue means reduced fitness. So these isolates have reduced fitness in many different conditions, and the one I'll draw your attention to is peroxide. So we thought that that was really a striking phenotype, um, in part because it was the strongest reduction in fitness amongst the isolates, and also since that's a very relevant condition to the human host, and that reaction, reactive oxygen species are very relevant upon phagocytosis, for example, of fungal cells by macrophages or other innate immune cells. So we predicted then that this sort of trade-off where the isolates evolve resistance to drug combinations but then are less fit with reactive oxygen species might suggest they'd be hypersensitive to killing by macrophages, for example. And that's exactly what we see. So here you're looking at an assay for viability of the fungal cells in macrophages. And these are the isolates, the parental strain, and then those that evolved resistance. And you can see we see the significant uh, increase in sensitivity to killing by macrophages. So we think there's these sort of trade-offs then that may restrict sort of how resistance can persist or spread in pathogen populations. And this, this sort of is encouraging. Resistance will always evolve. But if we can minimize it with fitness consequences, that sort of bodes well for preserving the lifespan of, of our various antifungals. So hopefully what I've shown you today is that HSP90 is a promising target for antifungal drug development. It's essential in all eukaryotes in which it's been tested. It regulates drug resistance and virulence traits in all the fungi that we've looked at, and also in many protozoan parasites and other organisms. Hopefully I've convinced you that a structure-guided approach provides a pretty powerful strategy to develop fungal selective inhibitors. We're pretty excited with where we've got with seven, and we think if we can move forward with this, that, that we'll have great prospects.
And uh, I also want to emphasize that evolutionary constraints may minimize the evolution of resistance to drug combinations involving HSP90 inhibitors. So we think that's, that's a hopeful opportunity as well. So with that, I'd just like to end by thanking all the people who were crucial to this work. Um, so there was a number of people involved in the projects. Teresa O'Meara has been key, Amanda Berry, Jessica Hill, and Kathy Collins were, were core from my lab. We've had really phenomenal collaborators, many of whom were from Duke University. So Joe Heitman and John Perfect have been very long-standing collaborators with whom we could not have done much of this work. We're delighted to now be working with Andy Alspa to try to generate some systems to regulate HSP90 in Cryptococcus. John Porco and Lauren Brown are leading our chemistry ex ex efforts here, and we're very excited about the project moving forward. And Terry Romer has been awesome in terms of getting these huge Candida mutant collections available to the public. And these are just incredibly powerful. We're doing really exciting science in, in other areas beyond this work. So with that, I would thank my funding sources. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Joe. The HSP90 inhibitors that 